Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on naming inorganic compounds. Now, there's literally millions of different compounds. And if we tried to remember the names randomly of all those millions of compounds, that would be an impossible task. For instance, things like glucose and sucrose and fructose and ammonia, to name a few. So I'm going to teach you a system today where we're going to learn how to name inorganic compounds that mainly involve combining metals and nonmetals or two nonmetals. We're not going to deal with the organic compounds that involve uh, combining carbon with hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. So here's a list of elements that we're going to typically use. First, I'll mention it's very important when you do the elements that you use a capital letter followed by a small letter. The reason why that is so vitally important is because rather than capital S and capital N for tin, this could indicate that it's a compound made of sulfur and nitrogen because capital N is the symbol for nitrogen. So we always use capital letter followed by small letter for all our elements. Now antimony, S, capital S, little b, You'll notice here's a common list of elements, and some of them use Latin names. For instance, uh, copper uses the Latin name cuprum. The reason for that is, I guess, C was already taken and CO was already taken for uh, cobalt. So they decided to use the Latin name for copper, cuprum. They followed the same idea when they were dealing with tin, stannum, and uh, a few more uh, iron, they used ferrum and antimony, to name a few. Natrium for sodium. Now we also use some of these Latin names, the ones that have asterisks, for a, a naming convention using prefixes us and ik, which I'll detail in a few minutes. So here we have some pictures of some common elements. Notice what some of the problem is here, are here. Well, sodium is a very active metal. In its pure elemental form, it has to be stored in a liquid other than water because water, almost everybody knows has taken high school chemistry that sodium will burst into flames in the presence of water. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is stored in, only in water because outside of water, it can burst into flames. So it's both of these substances are not stable in nature in their elemental form. They're always um, combined with other elements to form compounds. So the valence shell electrons are found in the outer energy level of the atoms, and it's what's involved in bonding when these compounds are created. So we're also going to use electronegativity values, which are um, essentially a, a number which tells you the relative strength with which an atom pulls on electrons. We'll also be using that later to do Lewis structures. But for now, we're going to talk about oxidation states which are simply numbers assigned to atoms when they either lose or gain electrons. We're going to assume for the most part that these compounds are all ionic for the sake of simplicity. And if they lose electrons, they become positively charged. If they gain electrons, they become negatively charged. So we always write compounds with the second part of the name ending in IDE because it's always going to be the negative element or polyatomic ion that is written second. The positive sign is always going to be given to the first element or polyatomic ion. <clears throat> and I'm going to use colors red and blue to distinguish them here. So these oxidation numbers are useful because when we create a compound, we're going to want a combination of charges that add up to zero. I'm going to show you how this is done in a few minutes. Now, we could always identify oxidation numbers by using our periodic table. It's a very handy reference. You can see the oxidation states are written as numbers. Some elements have more than one oxidation state. Some only have a single oxidation state. And I'll get to that and the importance of that in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So if I'm looking up the oxidation numbers of fluoride or fluorine, I could see it's minus one. If I looked up calcium, I can see it's always got a charge of plus two. Sulfur, 
Well, sulfur has multiple oxidation states. Sulfur atoms can lose electrons if they combine with more electronegative elements like fluorine or chlorine or oxygen. They can become positive two or positive four, positive six. <clears throat> or if it's combining with an element where it has a stronger electronegativity, then it's going to steal electrons and become negative. Now, the most important thing to remember is elements only have a single negative oxidation state when they are negative. And they're only negative when they're written second in a name. So this family will always be negative one when it's negative. They can also sometimes be positive. This family will always be negative two. This family will always be negative three. And carbon will always be negative four when it forms compounds and it's written second. Now, iron can be plus two or plus three or plus six. So it's also a multivalent atom. So we're going to talk about mechanisms we use to distinguish between those different oxidation states. So here are just some examples again of what I've just rhymed off. Some elements have multiple oxidation states and some don't. So a binary compound is two elements. The name always ends in IDE. There are some exceptions. There are some compounds that have more than two that end in IDE, but it's a very small minority. Cyanide is one. Sodium cyanide is not a binary compound, but <clears throat> for the most part, you see IDE, unless it's cyanide, it's gonna be binary, two elements only. We always write the metal first and the non-metal second. And if you look at the periodic table, that's kind of convenient because the metals are on this side of the table. Remember, there's a, a box here that goes across dividing the metals from the non-metals. So if I combine, for instance, magnesium with fluorine, I'm gonna have the magnesium is always going to be positive. The fluorine is always going to be negative because the magnesium wants to lose two electrons to achieve greater stability. The whole point of bonding is for substances to become more stable. When a substance is unstable, it will form bonds to become more stable. So invariably, um, <clears throat> stability is one of the driving forces in the universe. So when we look at a formula like NaCl, we can assume the sodium is positive and the chlorine is negative. We look up that sodium is positive one in the table, chlorine is negative, so it has to be negative one. Despite the fact there are all these numbers written here, remember what I said, the negative charge is only minus one for this family. There are not multiple negative charges. And how do we know the chlorine is negative? Because it's written second. Very important. So KBr is going to be called potassium bromide. Now, whenever the element only has a single oxidation state, there's no need to state the oxidation number in the name because there is only one way the potassium combines. There aren't two different forms of potassium, in this case, potassium bromide. There's only one potassium bromide, so we don't have to distinguish it from a cousin or a, a, a twin, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's quite a few examples where that does happen when writing formulas and naming compounds. Now for convenience, we're gonna treat all, uh, all icon, ionic compounds, even though they could be polar or covalent bonds, we're gonna treat them all as ionic compounds for our naming conventions. And the primary theory we're using is that the compounds are made from particles that add up so that there is no net charge. The positive and the negative charges will cancel each other out. And we do that by creating multiples of our positive and negative charges. We'll look at that in the first example here. Magnesium, you can see from our periodic table, always has a charge of plus two. And Chloride always has a charge of minus one. So if I'm going to put those two together, they don't add up to zero. So what do I have to do? I have to create two chloride ions to combine with that magnesium ion. And we can call them positive ion a cation. You can kind of see that plus sign in that T for a cation. So sodium chloride, the sodium is a cation. NaCl is the formula. Positive first, negative second. And 
positive potassium, negative chloride, one and one. Again, we find those in the periodic table for sodium. Now, this is the first example of the fact that the formula for sodium oxide is not NaO. Wish it was that easy. Since the charge of sodium is plus one and the charge of oxygen is always minus two, they have to combine in a way that the charges add up to zero. So we're gonna need two sodiums and one oxide. So the formula always tells us the number of sodium particles, the number of oxygens. <clears throat> and frequently in the formulas, I put charges over top of each of them to indicate what the charges are on the ions before the formula was written. So if you wanna put a one plus and a two minus here, that's fine by me. But the principle is the net charge has to add up to zero. So with aluminum being a charge of plus three, and fluoride being a charge of minus one. So aluminum plus three, fluoride minus one. Applying this principle that the, the particles are combined in a way where the net charge is zero, we're gonna need three fluorides. So it's AlF3. For copper oxide, notice there's an asterisk. Because when you look at copper, copper can have a charge of one or two. Therefore, there are two copper oxides. There's a copper one oxide and there's a copper two oxide. So can you guess which is which? Well, the charge on the copper is what determines whether or not we use one or two in the name. So we can use a system with Roman numerals and we use the charge in the name. So realistically, there is no copper oxide. There's copper one oxide and there's copper two oxide where we put the charge in brackets in Roman numerals which is capital I. Similarly with iron, we look up iron. Iron can be two, three, or six. And when it combines with chloride, chloride is negative one because it's second, remember? Always just negative one for this family if it's second. So iron chloride, really there's multiple forms of iron chloride. There can be iron two chloride, FeCl2, Again, apply the rule where the charges add up to zero, plus two added to minus two gives us zero, plus three added to minus three gives us zero. This is called iron three chloride, iron two chloride. Now we can also use an us, ick naming system where in the case of copper and iron, we can use the Latin name of copper and we can use the suffix us for the lower of the two oxidation states, plus one, is cuprus plus two is cupric. So this could be called cuprus oxide. This could be called cupric oxide. This would be called ferrous chloride. This would be called ferric chloride. Now, unfortunately, in the case of iron, they discovered other oxidation states than two or three. So if you use us and ick, it's going to be the two lower states, two or three, copper, one or two. Tin, stannous, stannic is two or four. Plumbus for lead is two or four. There's the USIC system. Now, when we name these, we can use any name that will be relevant. In this case, calcium always has a charge of two. <clears throat> that doesn't mean it has two charges. It just means its charge is always positive two. Because of that, we don't use the charge in the name. We simply call it calcium oxide. Barium always has a charge of two. Again, only one oxidation state, so we simply call it barium iodide. Rubidium always has a charge of one, so we call it rubidium oxide. Now notice an asterisk here. Mercury can be either a one or a two charge. So <clears throat> when we look at the periodic table, double check. That's the first thing. If, you're not, if you don't have the charges memorized, make sure you check. Since mercury can be one or two, we have to use the formula to figure out whether it's one or two. So again, HG2 means there's gonna be two mercuries, one oxygen. So applying our rule where the overall net charge has to be zero, mercury's charge has to be one in this case, HG2O. So we call it mercury one oxide, or we could call it mercurous oxide. The second one, HGO, the charge of mercury would be negative, would be positive two to balance the negative two for oxygen. 
So we could call this one either mercury two oxide or we could call it mercuric oxide. Now, <clears throat> those problems exist for multivalent ions. Those are ions where more than one charge exists. And you can see there's a whole pile of them. A lot of the transition metals are multivalent, like manganese, look at that. There's five different charges. Chromium, three, vanadium, four. Whenever you have a multivalent ion, tin, lead, thallium, mercury, you must use the charge in the name. And whenever there's only a single charge like scandium or yttrium or strontium or rubidium, you, you must not use the number in the name. So that's one of the first areas where students have difficulties. <clears throat> so again, we eliminate those ambiguities by using the oxidation state of the first element in the name. And again, I've mentioned that this is a standard system. It was devised by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, an organization called IUPAC. And it was designed to avoid confusion. They use Roman numerals and brackets for the oxidation state of the first element in the name, as we've shown. So it can be I for one, II for two, III for three, IV for four, V for five, VI for six, VII for seven, VIII for eight. That's Roman numeral system. So copper one oxide tells us the charge on copper is one plus. Charge of oxygen is always negative two. So it's Cu2O. And again, in the, in the answer, you could put a plus one on top of the copper and a minus two over the oxygen. So HG3N, the charge on nitrogen is negative three. If there's three mercuries, the charge on mercury must be plus one. The charges add up to zero. So it's, we're gonna call this mercury one nitride. Again, the one is not, the name is not the number in the formula, it's the charge. So work out the charges. In this case, chloride's minus one, the total negative charge is negative two. So the charge of iron, if there's only a single particle of iron, must be positive two. So it's Fe2 plus. Again, the charges add up to zero. FeCl2 is the formula. Iron two chloride is the name. Or we could also call it fair us chloride because iron can be two or three. The us is the lower of the two charges. So iron three sulfide tells us the charge of iron is three. The charge of sulfur is always minus two. And again, how do I know? Because when it's second, it has to be negative. There's only a single negative two there. Those, all the rest of those are positive charges. The sulfur has to be first in the formula. In this case, you see the sulfur is second. It's negative when it's second. So there's two irons and three sulfurs, Fe2S3. And again, the three in Roman numerals is the charge on the iron. And the us 6 system, which I've been going along with you, it's for multi uh, elements that have multiple oxidation states. You can use us and ick. I always remember us ick, us ick. Ick is the higher of the two states. So for instance, if I'm looking here, cuprus is one, cupric is two. Ferris is two, fair ick is three. Stannis is two, stannic is four. Plumbus is two, plumbic is four. Mercurus is one, mercuric is three. There's two, okay? Just to show you a few. <clears throat> and that occurs when the metallic element has more than one oxidation state. Now we require the Latin names and there they are. So in this case, there's four examples. Oxygen is always minus two. If it's combined with two coppers, must be plus one. So we're gonna call it copper one oxide or cuprous oxide. In this case, plumbic sulfide, the plumbic has a plus four state because lead can be two or four. To refresh your memory, lead can be two or four. So plumbic is the higher of the two, it's four. So that's four plus. Sulfur is always negative two if it's second. It's always negative two. 
So it's a PB plus four, a sulfur not minus two. When we balance the charges, we're gonna need two sulfurs. So we're gonna need PBS2. In this case, iron could be two, three, or six if we look at the periodic table. Chloride, on the other hand, is always minus one. So if there's two chlorides, the charge on iron has to be positive two to add up to zero. So we can call it iron two chloride, or we can call it ferrous chloride. Now, stannous nitride tells us it's the lower of the two states. Tin can be two or four. So SN2 plus. Nitride is always minus three. So we're gonna need a balance charge of zero. So we need two three minuses and three two pluses, giving us a six plus and a six minus charge. We'll combine these particles in a way where the total charge is zero. So there's gonna be three tins and two nitrogens. Now that's not to say that a molecule of tin nitride exists. It could be an ionic solid where the ratio of the particles in the solid are three to two, rather than just represent the formula for a molecule. A lot of these substances don't really form molecules. They are ionic solids that form arrays of oppositely charged ions arranged in various geometric patterns. It's the ratios that we're looking at that are important. Now, a prefix system is used for two non-metals. And again, non-metals are this small group over here, like sulfur and oxygen, like carbon and oxygen. You might be familiar with carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur monoxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide. Those are a few examples where we use a prefix system. <clears throat> Two non-metals are bonded together, usually covalent bonds, and the prefixes are there as shown. Now you have to remember what these are. We're gonna use them in organic chemistry as well. And we're gonna use them for two non-metals. In some cases, the prefix is dropped. For instance, <clears throat> if it's the first element. So for instance, for CO, we don't say monocarbon monoxide. We simply say carbon monoxide because monocarbon monoxide is a little bit wordy. So they just simplified it. If the first element's prefix is mono, it's dropped. Now, applying the rules we've learned, zinc always has a charge of two, so this is simply gonna be zinc sulfide. Iron can be two or three. We have to figure out which one it is. Oxygen's minus two. Iron must be plus two. So it's iron two oxide or ferrous oxide. Antimony can be three or five. Since there's two sulfurs, or three sulfurs and two antimonies, charge of sulfur is minus two for a total charge of minus six. Charge of antimony must be plus three to give us a plus six. So it's going to be antimony three sulfide. Calcium chloride, because calcium always has a charge of two. Barium oxide, because barium always has a charge of two. Copper can be one or two, so it's going to be called copper two bromide or cupric bromide. HgCl2 is going to be called mercury 2 chloride or mercuric chloride. H2O, prefix system we can use, dihydrogen oxide or water. This one we could say phosphorus tribromide. Again, we can drop the mono in front of phosphorus. Now, we could also call that phosphorus 3 bromide with Roman numerals. Either way, correct answer. So when we're writing formulas, again, we use charges. One uh, Sodium is plus one, chloride's minus one. <coughs> Calcium's plus two, bromide's minus one. So it's CABR2. Ferrous means the lower of the two states. Iron can be plus two or plus three. In this case, it's plus two. Sulfide is minus two. So they cancel out with one of each. Copper two iodide. Iodide is minus one. Copper has to be plus two in this case. So it's CUI2. Cuprous selenide tells us the lower of the two states, so it's plus one. Selenium is always minus two, Cu2Se. Manganese 2 oxide, oxide is always minus two. In this case, manganese is plus two, so one to one because the two charges add up to zero with one particle of each. Stannic sulfide, stannic is 
plus four, because 10 could be two or four. Ick means the higher of the two, so it's four. And the sulfide is minus two. So we get SNS2. Now, not all compounds are binary. I'm now going to teach you a system that deals with the compounds that don't end in IDE. The ones that end in ATE and ITE, they're called the eights and the ites, and there's literally thousands of those compounds that exist. And to learn them, we're gonna have to learn all these polyatomic ions, names and formulas, and we're, I'm gonna show you how they're derived all from acids, what we call oxy acids. Now, even though a polyatomic ion has more than one atom in them, the charge applies to the entire group of atoms, like a phosphate is PO4 has a charge of minus three. The minus three applies to the entire particle, the PO4 particle. And that's an important concept when learning how to write the formulas. So the key here though, for all of these polyatomic ions is to learn your oxy acids. And I'm gonna put them in a particular order on the periodic table, if you look in period two, you can see nitrogen and carbon are side by side. And then if you look in period three, go all the way to the right, you go, well, not all the way, there's a noble gas beside it, but they're not involved in bonding. So then we get chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus. So I invented this method years ago. I call it my Santa Claus method. Notice what they all have in common is hydrogen and oxygen. So what I've, realized is that we could go ho, 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 ho on a piece of paper, one underneath the other. And then we could remember nitrogen, carbon, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus. And then what I'm gonna do is take these numbers of hydrogens and organize them into a rhyme. One, two, one, two, three, just like in a dance class. And the second one I'm gonna remember is three, 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 four, four. So I literally remember the ic acids by memorizing Ho, 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 ho. Nitrogen, carbon, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus. One, two, one, two, three. Three, 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 four, four. And this gives me my ick acids, <clears throat> which we call nitric acid, carbonic acid, chloric acid, sulfuric acid, and phosphoric acid. So we get those five acids. Now I'm gonna show you another group of five acids. Notice the difference. All I've done is taken a single oxygen off the ick acids. And when we do that, we get the us acids. And we keep the names, the first part of the name the same. So what was nitric acid, HNO3 becomes nitrous acid. And similarly, carbonic acid was H2CO3 becomes H2CO2. Notice the number of hydrogens hasn't changed. That's the relationship between the ick acids and the us acids. Remove one oxygen. Another group of five acids comes from removing a second oxygen. So if nitric acid was HNO3, nitrous acid is HNO2, hyponitrous acid, HNO. So whenever you see hypo, it means remove an oxygen from the us. And whenever you see us, it means take an oxygen off the ick. So if you remember that ho, 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 nitrogen, carbon, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, one, two, one, two, three, 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 four, four, you're off to the races. Here I've just showed you 15 different compounds from that, and we're gonna add thousands to it. Now the next logical step is to show you what the prefix per means in chemistry. In chemistry, it means add an oxygen. So if nitric acid's HNO3, look what happens when we add the prefix per. We get five new acids per nitric, per carbonic, per chloric, per sulfuric, and per phosphoric. So I've just showed you five, uh, four families of five acids. So that's 20 different acids, all derived from our ho, 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 ho. So here are the ic acids. And now I'm going to show you even more possibilities. Remember family substitutions. Since the elements in the same family have the same number of valence shell electrons, they tend to react in similar ways. So if I know chloric acid, I know fluoric acid, bromic acid, and iodic acid. If I know sulfuric acid, I know selenic acid, telluric acid, and polonic acid. 
I know phosphoric acid, I know arsenic acid. If I know carbonic acid, I know silicic acid. So we can substitute within these families in each of those ICs, OSs, hypoases, and purates. So we had 20, and now it's going to be 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160, 180, 200, 220, 240. We have 240 possible acids now just by applying the simple system. <clears throat> So here we are, we can say, well, silicic acid is the same as silicon, the same family as carbon, carbonic acid. And do you necessarily have to remember the family substitutions? No, look at how nice I've been to you. Here's nitric acid. Okay, sorry, we start with phosphoric acid, arsenic acid, sulfuric acid, selenic acid, telluric acid, polonic acid. I don't have it, but it could apply for polonium as well. Chloric acid can be have fluoric acid. Notice how the number of hydrogens and the number of oxygens are written here. So nitric acid is HNO3. Phosphoric acid is H3PO4. Selenic acid, H2SEO4. Telluric acid is telluric minus an oxygen. So it's H2TEO3. So those numbers are on your periodic table if you have trouble memorizing the ho-ho-ho method. So again, with the us acids mean remove an oxygen, but I can also use it not just for chlorus, but for bromus, iodus, and fluorus. And I can use it for carbonus and, and silicon as well, siliceous. And iodus, same as chlorus. And tellurus, the same as sulfurous. <clears throat> remember, us means take away an oxygen. So if you remember family sulfur, H2SO4 is telluric acid or sulfuric acid. H2SO3 is sulfurous acid. So substitute in the family, H2TEO3, telluric acid. Many possibilities there with those family substitutions. Of course, same thing happens when you add the prefix hypo. So we now know not just <clears throat> hyponitrous acid means take off uh, uh, two oxygens from nitric, HNO3, HNO2, HNO. HNO is hyponitrous acid. So hyposilicious acid is H2SiO because carbonic acid is H2CO3. Silicic acid is H2SiO3. Hypo means take off two. If it's O3, it's O. Similarly, for chloric acid, we get HClO3, chlorus, HClO2, hypochlorous, HClO, hypobromous, HBRO, hypofluorous, HFO. And the same thing applies for the other examples. Now, again, we can do the same with our per ic acids. Per means add an oxygen. Nitric acid is HNO3, add an oxygen, HNO4. Carbonic acid is H2CO3, so add an oxygen, H2CO4. And again, we can do family substitutions. Instead of chlorine, we can use bromine. Perchloric is HClO4, perbromic HBrO4. Now, we, we have ic acids, we have us acids, we have hypoas acids, and we have per ic acids. And notice, we get the us and the hypoas by removing one oxygen and two oxygens. We get per ic acids by adding an oxygen to the ic acid. And there's a chart of all 20 of them. <clears throat> Kick in with this family substitutions and we get, like I said, hundreds more. Now the polyatomic ions all come from those acids. Let me show you how. So we have nitrate, carbonate, chlorate, sulfate, and phosphate. Where do they come from? Well, we can remove the hydrogens. We can strip off all the hydrogens. And when we do, the particles that are left are not neutral compounds, but charged ions that will combine with metals. And the charge on that ion is always the same as the number of hydrogens that are stripped off those ic acids. So if we remember the ic acids, we get all the eights. 
And the charge on eights, it's going to be one minus for nitrate. It's going to be two minus for carbonate. It's going to be one minus for chlorate. It's going to be two minus for sulfate. It's going to be three minus for phosphate. So here are the eights. And just as we created the us from the ic acids, we can create the ites from the eights the same way. We're going to take off an oxygen. And now we get, first I'll, I'll show you the names of the eights here, nitrate, carbonate, chlorate, sulfate, phosphate. We can get ites, nitrite, carbonate, chlorite, sulfite, phosphite. Notice the only thing that's different is one oxygen, just like when we went from the ic to the us acids. You go from the eights to the ites, you simply remove an oxygen. And the, the charge stays the same. And we're going to use hypo for the same reason. It's another oxygen removed from the ite. We got hyponitrite, hypocarbonite, hypochlorite, hyposulfite, hypophosphite. And we're going to use the prefix per the, the same way. Add an oxygen to the eight. The per eights, NO4 one minus, CO4 two minus, ClO4 two mi one minus, SO4 two minus becomes SO5 two minus in the per eight, per sulfate, and then per phosphate, PO5 three minus, add an oxygen. Again, notice the oxygen numbers change. The charges stay the same. And we have just learned a whole bunch of polyatomic ions. Ones that end in A tonight, some of them have prefixes per, some have prefixes hypo. <clears throat> and family substitutions again, here we go. Thousands more can happen with family substitutions. So if you know chlorate, you know fluorate, you know bromate, you know iodate. If you know sulfite, you know selenite, you know tellurite, you know polonite. If you know hypophosphite, then you know hypoarsenite. If you know hypo iodite, you know hypochlorite. So we can substitute families. And I'm going to show you some examples here. So all the blues are family substitutions. So we could call that silicate. We would call that fluorite. Call this hypotellurite. Hypoarsenite. We call this arsenate. We call that per bromate. So uh, now we literally have thousands of possible polyatomic ions that we can mix with all the different metals in the periodic table to produce millions of combinations. Now, when we have a polyatomic ion in the chemical formula, the overall formula still has to add up to zero. So it, let me give it a classic example here. Sodium phosphate made up of two pieces. All these formulas combine two pieces. So sodium is one piece, phosphate is the other piece. The negative three does not apply to the oxygen. The negative three applies to the entire PO4 particle. It's got five atoms in it. Its overall charge is minus three. So when it combines with a sodium with a charge of plus one, guess what? We're gonna need three sodiums. Balance the negative three charge of phosphate. <clears throat> so sodium phosphate, and you can write the charges in the name if you so desire. I usually put a plus one and a minus three above the formula to show where I got the answer from. There's going to be three sodiums combining with one phosphate to give us our overall neutral compound. This is a salt made up of positive and negative ions. The vast majority of these formulas are salts. Anytime they start with H, it's going to be an acid. <clears throat> now, here are some examples here. Sodium sulfite. So sodium is Na1 plus. Sulfite, remember sulfate is SO4, negative 2. Ite means take an oxygen off. So it's SO3, negative 2. But we're going to need two positive ones. So it's Na2, SO3. Magnesium carbonate, well, magnesium is always positive too. Carbonate comes from carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonate is CO3, negative two. So it's M Mg2 plus, carbonate two minus, one to one ratio, MgCO3. Luminal hypochlorite, a little more complicated. Hypochlorite, remember, chlorate is ClO3, one minus. Chloride is ClO2, one minus. Hypochlorite is ClO. 
one minus. Now, since the charge of aluminum is always positive three, we have to combine three CLOs or three hypochlorites with the aluminum. We give AL bracket CLO bracket three. Now, when I name this compound, it starts with hydrogen, it must be an acid. Nitric acid is HNO3. One less oxygen, nitrous acid. This one here, calcium always has a charge of positive two. No need to include its oxidation state. PO4 is phosphate. PO3, one less oxygen. Eights go to ites. Calcium phosphite. So you can see spelling is critical. If you were to put calcium phosphate, you would get zero. When I, I mark these out of one, no part marks. It's either right or wrong. Now, in addition to the polyatomic ions from those oxy acids, you can also get other combinations. For instance, if I take a hydrogen off water, assuming water can sometimes act like an acid, take a hydrogen off of it, just like you did with your oxy acids, and you get hydroxide. You can see the elements names here, hydrogen and oxygen, fairly straightforward, minus one charge, very common in bases. In fact, <clears throat> one definition of bases is a substance that makes hydroxide ion in water is classified as a base. Ammonium comes from an ammonia molecule that it, when put in water, there's a pair of electrons unshared that is uh, on the nitrogen atom. Well, that is like a magnet to a hydrogen atom from a water molecule. It pulls it off and a hydrogen frequently gets pulled off of a water molecule creating a hydroxide and an ammonium ion. So ammonium NH4 has a charge of one plus because when it pulls the hydrogen off of water, the electron is left behind on water. And that's why only the proton is transferred. That's why the plus one charge. Acetate comes from a common compound. Acetic acid loses its A hydrogen. It's also an organic acid called ethanoic acid, if you remember your organic chemistry. But in inorganic chemistry, we can simply call it acetate. C2, H3O2, one minus doesn't matter to me which way you write the formula, but it's a very common preservative. In fact, it was uh, why it's still widely used for pickling because it suppresses the growth of bacteria, and it's uh, readily available. You can make you can make vinegar from allowing wine to be infected with bacteria. It'll start turning alcohol into wine or into uh, uh, vinegar. You might have used vinegar wine um, in cooking. Permanganate. Per means add an oxygen. Manganate is MO3, one minus. So permanganate is MNO4, one minus. Chromate, CRO4, two minus. Dichromate, if I take two of these and stick them together and take off an oxygen, I get a dichromate. Bicarbonate is... If I take carbonic acid, H2CO3, and remove just one hydrogen, I get a polyatomic ion. It's not a neutral compound, none of these are, but we could also call it hydrogen carbonate. It's got two different names. Very common ingredient in kitchens. It's used to put out fires because uh, salts of bicarbonate, like sodium bicarbonate, when heated, decompose to release carbon dioxide gas and water, and it puts out a fire. It also is very good for absorbing odors. So hydrogen carbonate, bicarbonates are found in kitchens everywhere. So bisulfate, in, bi means in chemistry, it doesn't mean two. We use di to mean two. Bi means hydrogen. So another name for this would simply be hydrogen sulfate. Oxalate, oxalic acid, H2CTO4, it loses its hydrogen. Very common compound used to dissuade herbivores from eating the leaves of certain plants like potatoes and tomatoes. If you eat tomato leaves, potato leaves, they are not palatable. Uh, they will cause a gut ache because of the oxalates in them. <clears throat> it's also a problem with people that have gout. They have precipitates involving oxalates. Cyanide is a... Uh, a very, very poisonous substance in a salt like sodium cyanide. You can mix it with acid to make hydrogen cyanide gas, which will kill you very quickly because the cyanide ion acts like an electron receptor in the electron transport chain. 
and shuts down cellular respiration. Shut down cellular respiration, you die. That's why high school and university chemistry labs typically don't have salts of cyanide. We just don't want an accident where an acid accidentally combines with a salt of cyanide, making hydrogen cyanide gas. And now we have another one called cyanate. It's OCN1 minus, and it's cousin thiocyanate. Well, thio means take an oxygen and replace it with a sulfur because they're in the same chemical family. They behave very similarly. So cyanate is OCN or CNO1 minus. Thiocyanate is SCN1 minus. Replace the oxygen with a sulfur monohydrogen phosphate and dihydrogen phosphate. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we use mono and di here. When we had carbonate and sulfate, they had a charge of minus two. When we added a hydrogen to them, they became a charge of minus one. If we were to add another hydrogen to them, they would now not be ions anymore, but neutral compounds. They would be carbonic acid and sulfuric acid. That's not the case with phosphate, however. With phosphate, PO4 three minus, we can either add one hydrogen to it, which is a plus one charge. Remember the plus one and the minus three add up to minus two. We can still add another hydrogen to this. So we can get what's called a dihydrogen phosphate. So only with the phosphate <clears throat> do we have to distinguish the monohydrogen from the dihydrogen. And I'll do a couple of examples here. So potassium is a plus one charge, acetate is a minus one charge, one to one ratio, there's the formula. Ammonium oxalate, ammonium is NH4, oxalate is C2O4 two minus. Because it's a minus two charge, we're gonna need two ammoniums to balance it. And to accomplish that, we need brackets to show us that it's two of the NH4s. So in reality, there's two nitrogens, eight hydrogens, two carbons, two oxygens, and ammonium oxalate. When we name, when we look up car, uh, Cu, we can see copper can be either plus one or plus two. Dichromate is a charge of minus two. So this copper, since there's only one of them, must be a plus two. So we could call that copper two dichromate, or we could call it cupric dichromate. In this example, that's called thiocyanate. Its charge is minus one. Since there's three irons, its charge must be positive three to balance the whole thing to zero. So we could call it iron three thiocyanate, or we could call it ferric thiocyanate. Now, please make sure that you practice all the questions in your course pack. There's a couple of sheets there. You have to do them. You can't learn this by just watching this PowerPoint presentation. You have to do it yourself. So please work hard on them. And if you need any help, contact me. I also have extra sheets I can give you if you need additional practice to master it. So for now, 